And there was a lot of laughter and a lot of jokes about thing, little green men in outer space. 50 years ago, that's the way it was. Now things have changed. Now people are looking at, looking at are they a threat militarily? What kinds of sensors do we have? What kind of metrics do we have? These objects can drop 70,000 feet in a few seconds. Think about that. It can drop a tremendous distance in just a few seconds, and they can go underwater. This is something that we didn't realize before, but yes, they can actually go underwater. And they also move without creating an exhaust or breaking the sound barrier. So these are things that we can now document frame by frame looking at these videotapes. That was physicist Michio Kaku on Joe Rogan talking about the sea change that he's seen in the stigma. Personally, I think there's still a huge stigma. There aren't people racing to come and talk to me and share videos on YouTube, okay? So the stigma, I think, is still still really there. The point of this video, though, is to go through on the science. Where is the science of UFOs right now? What could possibly even start to explain some of these crazy effects that we're seeing, and, and what are they? Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. Welcome to the channel. I'm Chris Lado, a retired F-16 pilot, now focused on UAP investigation. I have a background in chemistry and material science. This information hasn't really changed since the days back in the 50s. Okay, so we had hypersonic velocities picked up on radar. We had visual, so we have visual observations from people. We have fighters trying to intercept these UAPs. Okay, we have UAP Foo Fighter accounts back in World War II. So this, this has been going on a long time and our science on it really hasn't been paying attention. Okay, if we are paying attention, it's in secret, very classified government vaults where they're looking at it without letting anyone know. Our understanding of UAPs hasn't progressed. Okay, and that's the whole reason we started UAP Society to look at a different angle, to take a different tact, if you will, at finding out what these UAPs are and what they can do. So thanks for being here. Smash that like button if you do like this content. Subscribe to get notifications of my future videos. I release a video at least every Friday. And then join patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato to get behind the scenes access and additional information plus just to support the channel. This has been a big push, okay? And I know in the community, you know, you have the CE5 Stephen Greer community. And if you go to their Discord, you cannot, you literally cannot say whatever the phenomena is, is a threat. You can't even propose that it's possibly a threat. That is the way the military has looked at it because the military has to look at everything as a threat until they understand what it is. Okay, this argument that I've heard out of the military, because I was in the Air Force 24 years, man, this argument coming out of the Pentagon that, okay, we don't know what it is, but it's not a threat. Okay, this is, this is bullshit. Okay, this is total BS. That it's not, doesn't make sense in a military mindset. Okay, because everything is a threat until we understand what it is, right? I mean, it makes sense. You have to identify something as a not threat before you know it's not a threat. Otherwise, everything could be a threat. It just makes sense. Like the military doesn't go out there and see something and be like, hmm, I'll just avoid that. I don't know what it is, but it's probably not a threat, right? Or I know it's not a threat. Not true. Okay. So they have to look at it like it is a threat. And the reason they're not looking at it is really weird to me. Why are they not looking at it? And I think the stigma comes into it, maybe classified. That's the biggest thing. How can the military say they don't know what it is, but it's not a threat, right? How can they say they don't know what it is, but we're not looking into it more, or we're not gonna share the data? It's just insane to me. So that whole threat thing that you mentioned there, I think it's key because you have to get the military to move. You have to get them to actually do some effort towards this, and they haven't been for, I don't know, however many decades, and you have to call them on it, right? That's what the military does, protect the nations against threats, okay? You have to identify something before you can tell it's a threat. So that whole argument, just ridiculous to me. So let's go through, what does he talk through? What can we actually pick these things up with? What actually picks up UAPs? Look at what UAPX did, man. They just went to the Catalina Islands, basically where the UAPs are, set up a bunch of different spectrum, bunch of different sensors, all different types, all different spectrums. 
Okay, what did they find? A lot of stuff. They found a lot of stuff. So multi-spectrum. Basically, we just have to go and look. Like if we go and look, actually look with sensors, we'll find stuff. What are we looking for? Multiple spectrum. Okay, so they show up a lot in infrared. If you look at Dave Falch's, he had to take it down. But Dave Falch, he had a video on Jacksonville UAP where he could see something with an infrared, medium wave, infrared technology from military. So military grade. But when he switched to optical, disappeared, right? No more uh, UAP. So it seems like infrared, we actually pick them up more. You can also pick them up at night. That's what these FLIR cameras, forward-looking infrared, the targeting pod, the gimbal, the go fast, the FLIR video, those are all in infrared, okay? You can, actually, they did switch to optical on the FLIR video, not the other ones, but you did get, you're getting multiple spectrum, okay? So that's what we want. We want multiple spectrum and we're catching them, okay? We can catch them in optical. We're able to get video of these things in optical. We're able to get video of them in infrared. We're able to pick them up on radar, okay, based on the Nimitz engagement. They were able to pick them up on multiple types of radar. The Spy-1 radar, the E-2 radar supposedly picked it up. And then the fighter radar, I believe he was able to get some hits. Okay, some hits on this radar. Of course, when in the Nimitz, as soon as he locks on now, he loses the lock. It implies to me some sort of aware jamming, if you will. Okay, but that's it. How, how can we pick up these things? Many, many things. Many different ways. The key is to go and actually look. Okay, to go and look and then share the data. We have a lot of people looking. We have a lot of people not sharing the data. Okay, including the government. Okay, they haven't released any videos besides that crappy video that they released during the hearings. Okay, otherwise they've released nothing or information. An analysis of these objects. These objects travel between Mach 5 and Mach 20. That's 20 times the speed of sound. So Mach 5 above that is hypersonic. Okay, I just did a review on the new Top Gun Maverick movie where he goes 10.3 Mach. Okay, so 10 times the speed of sound. The fastest humans have gone is 6.7 Mach. Okay, the fastest I've gone, because I know people always ask, is 1.83 Mach, which was faster. 1.83, it's like 18 miles a minute. Okay, but that is very fast. Up to Mach 20 is also insanely fast, like he's talking about. And really key here is, is you can't turn at those speeds. Okay, if you're going that fast, your kinetic energy is just so far that way, right? It took the SR-71, when it was going fast, what would they say, like three states to turn around, okay? Because it's going so fast. How do you actually turn a vehicle like that, right? How do you turn something with that much kinetic energy? It's very difficult, okay? So anything that can zigzag, okay, where you see actually these kinetic movements, these kinetic changes, that cannot be done at speed, okay? We do not know how to do that. We can't just change direction drastically that that requires immense accelerations those are those gravities he's talking about. how many thousands of g's okay the nimitz if you look at uh, kevin canoe's paper his peer-reviewed paper one of the only peer-reviewed papers maybe the only one on uaps that was on uh, the nimitz so analyzing anomalous events if you look into that paper they go up to 7,000 G's, average around 5,000 G's. So the numbers are just off the charts, okay? So the physics of these, like Michio Kaku's talking about, completely defy all of our physical laws, okay? They act, they behave as a laser pointer. If you're shining a laser pointer on the wall and you move it around, right? Like you wanna decoy a cat or something. This is how these things move, okay? Almost like they're moving without mass. They're somehow able to remove mass from their equation. They can make light operate as a particle. Somehow they're able to manipulate light and matter or it's some effect, okay? Some weird effect that's going on that's causing this. Maybe it's indigenous to the planet or, or something. There's some weird effect, okay? But they can move like light is basically how I can describe it. There's no sonic booms. When he talks through, how do you go hypersonic with no sonic booms? Okay, if you're traveling through air, you have to push that air out of the way. The fact that we haven't seen any sonic booms from any of these UAPs and no sound just imparts to me that they're not fully there, at least how we understand it. These things are not actually really there. It's somehow a visual representation or their physics are so advanced that they can somehow manipulate light. Objects can zigzag and we can measure the G-force inside the, this object. The G-forces are several hundred times the force of gravity. In other words, any living person's bones would be crushed by these objects, so they're probably drones of some sort. These objects can drop 70,000 feet in a few seconds. Think about that. It can drop a tremendous distance in just a few seconds, and they can go underwater. So he mentions there, Michio Kaku mentions, they're probably drones of some sort. I've heard this from other investigators as well. They appear to be AI. There's some sort of intelligence, but we don't know how advanced maybe, or can we even relate to it? 
You know, because they appear elusive drones that can somehow manipulate physical laws. They can somehow manipulate light. That's kind of the impression I get from Michio Kaku and from other investigators that I've talked to. Okay, not necessarily my opinion. For me, why, why does it have to be drones? That's just what we are building right now. You know, we're creating drones. So in us, that's what we think of. It could be like uh, imparting our own, you know, mirror imaging, if you will. At any rate, no sound, right? No sound from sonic booms. He mentions also as well as that they can just remain stationary in high wind and go through the water. Okay, so stationary in high wind, no sound, no sonic booms, can go right through water. To me, they're behaving like light. Somehow, they don't have to fully interact with the atmosphere or the matter that uh, we're dealing with. This is something that we didn't realize before, but yes, they can actually go underwater. And they also move without creating an exhaust or breaking the sound barrier. So these are things that we can now document frame by frame looking at these videotapes. He mentions there are no observable exhaust. That's also <laughs> quite interesting, okay? The gimbal, the gimbal object, that's the most noted. Gimbal object basically shown to be shorter range. Okay, it can't be out, despite what Mick West says, can't be outside of 10 nautical miles. They have backing up radar evidence. They have corroborating visual reference from the, the pilots that actually intercepted the gimbal object. That thing is moving 250 knots up at altitude. Okay, so a balloon cannot move that fast unless you happen to be in the jet stream. And then we would have known it was 250 knots. So where, how is it moving? How is it going that fast at that altitude? And there was no exhaust coming out of the gimbal object. In that sense, it's moving, right? Again, not interacting really with the environment doesn't need to push any sort of propulsion. It uses a propulsion that we don't understand. It's almost like it, that, that it's not really there. It's like an optical illusion. Michio Kaku says later on, it, almost like it's an optical illusion that's it i would say that they can it's it's light like we're dealing with some sort of light phenomena if they are weather balloons that you confuse with a flying saucer uh, then they would be moving with the direction of the wind but these objects do not do that these objects can go against the direction of the wind not only that but we have multiple sightings if an object is very very far away i mean if an object is close to you but you think it's far away <laughs> Then, it, then it's traveling at an enormous velocity while it's actually just drifting in front of your eyes. How do you tell the difference? By having multiple sensors, radar, infrared sensors, visual sighting. Then you can tell how far this object is away from you, and then you can say that, no, nope, it's an optical illusion. Well, we do that now. We have multiple sightings of these objects. By radar, we know how the velocity, the distance. Each time, it comes out to be real. And so that's why we're scratching our heads. Who has this capability? And the answer is, we don't know. Well, I do kind of have to mirror Mick West here and ask, where is this data that he's talking about? Okay, this frame by frame data of clear video and multi-spectrum analysis. Okay, maybe I just haven't seen it yet because that's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get multiple angle video from our Sky360 partners. Go to sky360.org grassroots organization, nonprofit based out of Austria is building these cameras to get that multiple angle. And we can throw max, max different uh, spectrum on there to try and analyze UAPs from many different angles, many different spectrums. So that's UAP site. That's, that's why we're doing it. We can immediately, if we can get two systems down, we can triangulate now and determine that it's not one of these things. Okay. And what was very interesting, I did range Fowler reports up the East coast a few months ago from that video. Our pilots have been reporting a lot of weird events. Okay. From 2019, I think there was 11 different events that I covered in that video. I can uh, relay the, the card here, 11 different events. Weird to me is that they stayed in the same position, so stationary and high winds. That is hugely weird to me. Michio Kaku mentions it here, stationary and high winds. Nothing can just sit there in the, in the environment. Okay, if you're in the, if you're in the ocean and your current is going 10 knots that way, everything is going 10 knots that way, right? As a fighter pilot, something outside of the wind, outside of the movement of the wind is something outside of nature for me uh, and very strange. One thing he doesn't mention, at least in this clip, is about biological effects and we have had impacts on our nuclear facilities okay so people that have been close contact or nearby these things have said there's a humming i've read reports of military people being close to large triangles and they hear a large deep humming is what they actually feel okay but that's it for sound otherwise there's no sound the other issue with biological effects is people that have been at least close it's hypothesized about 100 people 
uh, have had biological effects. So brain, basically brain damage, you have a brain growth that are kind of all similar related to Havana syndrome is actually what it looks like. And Gary Nolan, Dr. Gary Nolan, he's another scientist or he's a scientist involved in UAP research. He's analyzed uh, MRIs from over 100 people of these weird biological effects. Okay, so some weird human effects that can also cause issues, as well as the 1967 Maelstrom incident. This was brought up at the congressional hearing. Robert Salas, he was in the, the silo basically back in 1967 when they had some weird, crazy orange orbs show up. The base guards were going nuts. And what they had is all of their ICBMs, their intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles designed never to go offline, all went offline at the same time. Okay, they are in parallel all went offline at the same time. All their guidance systems went offline at the same time, temporarily, right? And then as soon as these orbs are gone, boom, the guidance systems come back to normal. Everything's fine, okay? So that's some weird stuff right there, okay? Is, is, is that, did they cause it on purpose? Did they cause these guidance systems to go offline? Or is it just some weird effect of the propulsion system that we don't fully understand? You know, what are these things? What is, what is a giant glowing orange orb? Is it some other being? Is it, is it an AI thing? Is it a drone? Uh, is it just a coming out of the earth? Is it related to some weird effects? But you keep hearing about these orbs following ships, you know, following Navy ships out there. I've gotten two very, you know, personal, I was there accounts written to me about orange orbs following them out at sea, okay? And then shooting up into space. Like, what is that? What are these things, okay? If the government knows about this, why aren't they telling us? I think it's very strange. Thanks for being here, everybody. Remember to smash that like button. If you do like this content, subscribe to get a notification of my future videos. I'll release a video every Friday at least. Support the channel, patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Get backstage access specifically to Lato files. And then finally, if you want to get involved, we need people to actually get involved, to get out there. You want to get your hands dirty. Are you tired of being frustrated and not being able to do anything about this topic? Why not learn something? Get out there. Help us build one of these Sky360 systems. Go to sky360.org. Help them look at AI material, okay? We need to figure out. We need to train our actual neural network of our systems. Come help, okay? We're, this is a community decentralized project. We're doing it. The, the NFTs just actually will fund the science, but pff, whatever. We'll do it without the funding. We'll do it with people, people's help, volunteer, grassroots, because we want to find out the information. You know who's not going to tell us? The government. The government is not going to tell us, okay? So <laughs> that's it. All right, guys. Have a great week. Peace.